Hi folks, hope you're enjoying and benefiting from our guitar lesson series. Remember, it's essential that you watch these lesson videos in order. Each lesson leads into the next and you won't get the big picture if you skip any of the steps. Many of you have been searching for these answers for years. You might be tempted to jump ahead and look at lesson 24 because you're into the blues, but if you don't know your intervals and modes from lesson 12 and 17, you just ain't going to get it. Consider purchasing the 150-page official course handbook for $19.95 from our website at www.absolutelyunderstandguitar.com. You'll find that link multiple places here on our YouTube channel. Each of the 32 video lessons has a corresponding printable page that you can view to help with review and memorization. All of the charts and graphs I create in the videos are reprinted there. The package also includes our amazing chord, scale, and arpeggio encyclopedia containing most every useful finger pattern known to man. Reserve your copy today. If you like what you're learning here, tell all your friends and like and subscribe to our channel. So enjoy this lesson and continue on and you will absolutely understand guitar. Hi, welcome back to Absolutely Understand Guitar. I'm Scotty West. Today, we delve further into the fascinating world of pitch. You're all interested in learning about scales and chords. Well, these are just patterns of notes, patterns of pitch. But first, we're going to get just a little bit scientific about pitch in order to begin to see how the guitar actually works. This is lesson two, so make sure your booklet is open to page two. All set? Here we go. Hi, welcome back. Got a lot of stuff to cover uh, this week, uh, amazing stuff. Um, remember last week, we, or your very first lesson, we actually learned that music is a language and it has six parts of speech. These are the six main areas of music. Pitch, rhythm, timbre, dynamics, technique, and notation. Well, uh, in order to be a real player, you gotta make sure that you can answer yes to those six different questions over there. A lot of people are only fooling themselves into believing that they're playing music. You can look back at tape number one and memorize all that stuff. We got too much to talk about today to really do much of a review. I just wanted to remind you that the largest body of information that you have to learn about in music is this stuff about pitch. What is pitch about? Well, remember, as most of you know, pitch is about high and low. But high and low what? Well, the first word we learn to associate with pitch is it's all about what notes you play. And um, we take these notes and we arrange them in various patterns. And that's what chords and scales and melody and harmony and intervals and progressions and arpeggios, all the very things you want to learn about, that's all about pitch. And that's the stuff that we're going to be talking about today. Okay, let's flip the page here. And the first thing we're going to do with pitch is we're going to get just a little bit scientific about it. So what do we know about pitch so far? Well, we know that pitch is about high and low. But high and low what? Well, the first word, as I said, that we learn to associate with pitch is it's all about what notes you play. But the other big word that you want to learn to associate with pitch is the whole concept of frequency. This is the scientific word for what pitch is all about. Now, some of you might remember a little bit of this from science class at one time or another. You know about sound waves, and you know that everything that's making noise is vibrating, and it's sending out waves through the atmosphere. Well, um, in a sense, that's all your guitar basically is. It's just a sound wave generator. It just generates sound waves, and you can very specifically control the frequency. And what is the frequency of the sound wave? Well, you know that everything that's making noise is vibrating, and it's sending out waves through, through the atmosphere. And so, let's say that we're... We don't have to look at the keyboard here. Let's say um, I play this note on a piano keyboard. And this is a low-pitched note, isn't it? And let's say we could actually see what sound waves look like. There is a device called an oscilloscope that's kind of like a computer screen, and you could look and you could see what this sound wave looked like. So I play this low note on the piano here, and we look and we see a sound wave that goes by, and it's looking like this. 
And this sound wave is traveling in a specific direction. Let's say it's traveling in this direction, right like this. Now, what they'll tell you the frequency of the sound wave is, is the number of wave peaks. Why the peaks? Well, it's just a convenient place to measure from. But it's the number of wave peaks that pass a fixed point in a certain amount of time. And maybe that fixed point is your ear. So let's say there's your ear right there, and the sound wave is entering your ear. Frequency is the number of waves that enter your ear in a certain amount of time, usually measured in cycles per second or in units called hertz. Now, at one moment, we're hearing this low pitch note like this, and we see a sound wave that looks like this. Now, the next moment, let's say I play a high pitch note up here on the keyboard. That's a high pitch note, isn't it? We look back at the oscilloscope again and we see a sound wave going by that looks like this. Now, obviously, these wave peaks are much closer together than these are. Looks like it's somewhere in the vicinity of about 10 to 1 here. Now, so what that means is a lot more of these sound waves are going to bump into your eardrum in a second than these are up here. So this would be considered low frequency, and this is high frequency. And low frequency means low pitch, and high frequency means high pitch. So it's all about how far apart the waves are from one another that, is, that determines the frequency of the sound. Well, as we said, really, you know, we keep calling the guitar the dumb machine, and, and we're going to be covering how it works in the next lesson. But, you know, now it's time for us to actually understand what kind of a machine it is. Uh, a, a musical instrument is nothing more than a sound wave generator. And, and all it meant to do is, is generate these sound waves. Not only that, it generates sound waves of very precise and controllable frequencies. But how does it do that? Well, different instruments do it in different ways, but you're here to learn about the guitar, which is a stringed instrument. What that means is you've got a piece of wire stretched between two points. And what you do is you pluck that wire and you cause it to vibrate back and forth like that. Those are the vibrations of the string. Well, the speed at which that string goes back and forth is what puts the wave peaks where they are. So the speed of the vibration of the string is what controls the frequency. If that string is wobbling back and forth fairly slowly, it tends to send out waves that are further apart. But if that string is vibrating back and forth at a million miles an hour, it sends out waves that are closer together like that. So for our basic lay purposes, just to understand how the guitar works, pitch is about frequency, which is all about the speed of vibration of the string. It's the speed of the vibration of the string that determines the frequency of the note. But what we said was you can actually control the frequency, you can control the pitch, you can control the vibrating speed of the string on a guitar. How do you do that? Well, we humans control the speed of vibration in stringed instruments using three different factors. The first factor is the mass of the string. That's why if you look at your guitar strings, they aren't all the same thickness, are they? If you've put your strings on properly, which is very important, um, you, you'll notice that the, uh, the low pitch strings are thicker than the high pitch strings are. So therefore, they're going to vibrate slower and, and send out waves that are further apart. That's, so when you put your strings on your guitar, you've got to make sure you put them on in the right order and there's stuff to know about string gauge and stuff like that. We can't go into that right now. Um, now, that's factor number one. What's the second factor that we use to control? the vibrating speed of the string. It is the tension that you stretch the string to. So that's why you've got your tuning machines on your guitar up there. These are these things that you tighten and loosen the strings with, and that's what tuning the guitar is all about. Um, uh, uh, just a quick word about tuning, too, if I haven't mentioned this before. The best way, and really the only way, that you're going to want to think about tuning your guitar is get yourself an electronic tuner. And my recommendation is get yourself an electronic chromatic tuner, an auto chromatic tuner. And uh, we'll be talking about this later in the program. 
program, but that's really the only way that you're going to want to try to tune your guitar. Tuning the guitar by ear is just too difficult for beginners, and you will waste too much time and, and, and not get the result you want anyway. So get yourself an electronic chromatic tuner and be done with it right there. So that's what tuning is. That's the second way that we adjust the vibrating speed of the string is by tightening or loosening them to certain, shall we say, culturally agreed upon pre-prescribed vibrating speeds, and that's what tuning your instrument is. But really, it's factor number three down here that's really the big one when it comes to actually playing songs on your instrument. The third way that we manipulate the vibrating speed of the string is by controlling the length of the string. And people go, huh? Wait a minute, how does that work? Well, I'll show you on my guitar here. Um, it's moment by moment, it's the length of the string. How do you actually play n different notes on a guitar? Well, what you do is you move your fingers around on the neck of the guitar on these things called frets. I'm moving my fingers around up here. What am I doing when I do that? Well, I'm changing the length of the string. If I pluck my low E string here with none of my fingers on the neck at all, it's vibrating along its entire length from where it connects to the instrument up here to where it connects to the instrument down here at the bridge. It's vibrating along its entire length. But if I were to put my fingers, say, here on the neck of the guitar, I'm forcing the string against that piece of wire right there. That's called a fret right there, as you probably already know. I'm forcing the string against that piece of wire, and I'm stopping the vibration of the string at that point. So that means this part of the string up here isn't doing anything anymore. I've shortened the length of the string. It's no longer this long. It's only this long. And the further I move my hand up the neck, the shorter I'm making the string. Well, the shorter the string is, the faster it vibrates, the closer together that the waves are that it sends out, and we humans have this experience of the pitch getting higher. See, I just am continually making the string shorter and shorter, and therefore the pitch is getting higher and higher. That's how you actually manipulate pitch to actually play songs on your instrument. So, the three factors involved in controlling pitch on stringed instruments is the thickness of the string, how tightly they're stretched, but most notably the length of the string, and that's what fretting is when you're moving your fingers around on your frets. Okay, that's basically all that you have to know about the science of pitch in order to understand how your guitar works. The next big question that we're going to ask ourselves is the uh, a huge question. I love to get people to understand this question. So many people have misconceptions about this. If you don't understand about this, you don't really, you're not going to get anything really about music. Uh, I know they explain this different ways, different places, but you got to trust me, this is really, uh, particularly as you go through this program, you're going to see this is where you're really going to see how pitch works in music. Um, so this is our first, we, we just talked about the science of pitch. This is our first big uh, thing on the actual aesthetics of pitch. How, and aesthetics, what does that mean? That's, that's the artful usage of something. It's about how we use something in an art form. Um, so this is the first real aesthetic question about how pitch works, how we use these pitches in the art form that we call music, and it goes like this. You know that music is a language, right? And like any language, music has an alphabet. And long before they can teach you how to use anything in, an, in a language at all, they have to teach you how the alphabet works. And the first thing that you need to understand about that alphabet is how many basic units there are in it. For example, you know that in the English language, you have an alphabet that consists of 26 units. And to form all these different words and sentences and stuff like that, you select units out of that 26-unit alphabet, and you arrange them in different patterns. What do we call these patterns? We call them words. And you know that all the thousands and thousands of words that you know in the English language are all created out of this same basic 26-unit English alphabet. Well, the same thing is going on in music. Music is a language, and it has an alphabet as well. And we would like to know how many units it has in it. And the reason for that is, is all the music you've ever heard, from Bach to the Beatles to Bush and back again, including, don't tell you, let, let anybody tell you that, like, Indian music or African music or Chinese music is, is like really that different from ours. Yes, it is different. Yes, it has some significant differences, but the truth of the matter is the simila similarities far, far outweigh the differences. And so essentially all the music you've ever heard is constructed out of this same basic alphabet in music. And you first question that you need to understand is how many 
units are there in that alphabet? Or in other words, how many basic notes are there? How many notes? Now, you know that they repeat again in different octaves. We'll be talking about what that means, too. But in the musical alphabet, how many basic units are there? Take a moment, even if you want to pause the machine even for a moment and think about it, and then I'll give you the answer. Well, let me tell you, let me start by telling you the most common wrong answers. By far, the most common wrong answer is eight. And I go wrong, and they go wrong. What do you mean? Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, eight. Aren't there eight notes in music? You know, they taught us that pattern back in kindergarten, and didn't they give us that idea that everything was made out of those eight notes? Well, the first problem with that is uh, we repeated do twice. We began with do, and we ended with do. So we, we repeated one of the notes. So it can't be eight. Second most common answer then is people go, well then, okay, seven. And I go, wrong. And they go, wrong, what do you mean? A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Seven. Nobody's heard of an H or an I or a J or a K notes. It, it always seems to just go up to G's. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, seven. What's wrong with that? Well, I go, the problem with that is A through G, those are just the white keys on the piano. What about the black keys up here? And people go, well, those are the sharps and flats, right? And I go, yeah. And they go, well, I was kind of given the impression that the sharps and flats are somehow different than the white keys on the piano. And I go, I know why you think that, because that's kind of the dumb way they usually try to teach music. But in the end, nothing could be further from the truth. You're going to find out that the black keys are just as common, just as important, and do not reflect any different kind of phenomenon than the white keys do. People go, but wait a minute, that's A and that's A sharp right there. Isn't A like the real note and A sharp is like the, some weird modification of that? And I go, no, actually nothing could be further from the truth. And the only thing that ever made us think there was some kind of hierarchy there is the kind of a strange system that they created over the centuries to assign names to these notes. Uh, but in the end, they just decided to call that A and they just decided to call it A sharp. By the way, people go, well, then why did they color code it like that? Why, if all the notes are equally important, why didn't they just make them all the same color. Where did this black and white color coding system come from? And I go, it really doesn't have much to do cosmically with music. It really just has more to do with human visual perception. I can look, I can practically look at the ceiling and go, okay, I'm going to play an A. And I swivel around and I can go right to that note like immediately because I have memorized that, for example, A is just to the right of center in the group of three black keys. So really it's just a convenience for your eye to see where you are. And it's left everybody with this impression that the black keys are different different than the white keys and they aren't. Um, now, um, and some people go, but wait a minute, I took piano lessons for a while and, and, and all we ever did was play the white keys. And, and my question then to people is, well, how long did you take piano lessons for? And they go, ah, a couple of weeks, a couple of months, a year or so. I go, well, see, that's it. If you'd stuck with it longer, gradually they would have just uh, included more and more of the black keys until you just found out that, in, that you use the black keys just as much as the white keys. Now, I know you're here to take guitar lessons. Here I am showing you the keyboard again. But remember, this does exactly, basically exactly the same thing that your guitar does and sometimes it's just easier to see music theories on the keyboard and then we're going to translate them as we go uh, into uh, onto the guitar. So what is the answer? How many notes are there in the system of pitch that we use in the Western world uh, to play music? Well the answer is seven white keys and five black keys. See, there's a group of two and a group of three before they begin to repeat. Seven white keys, five black keys. The answer is twelve. There is 12 notes in our pitch system, and that's going to come as a surprise to a lot of you. But trust me, you've got to believe what I'm talking about. And you want to think of this as your alphabet in the language of music. You will never really understand music, at least in any kind of modern context at all, if you don't look at music that way. It's a language, it has an alphabet, and that alphabet has 12 units in it. And then all we do is select units out of that alphabet and form them into different patterns and type them, if you will, on our typewriter over here. Remember our analogy of music is a language, then a guitar is just something like a typewriter. And that's what all your various finger patterns are about. And so. 
Um, in the English language, if we selected those units and put them in patterns, we would call those patterns words, wouldn't we? And remember, there's all different types of words. There's nouns and verbs and adjectives and pronouns and prepositions and all this kind of stuff like this. Well, in music, we have our 12-unit alphabet. We select units out of it and form them into patterns, but we don't call them words. We call them things like chords and scales and melody and harmony and stuff like that. And that's what so much of this program is going to be about, is learning how to create these patterns. And I might have said last week that there's about 50 basic patterns, 50 different words in the musical language that you have to understand something about. And that's what this most of this whole program is all about. So there you go. Huge things about pitch, the physics of pitch, and the first aesthetic question. How does it work as an art form? You have 12 notes in your alphabet. Okay, now, this stuff that we're going to cover right now, I always say, I think this is the most important stuff that you're ever going to learn from anybody on the subject of music. In some ways, this is the most important part of this entire program, what we're going to talk about now. And once again, it's about pitch. And what do we know about pitch so far? Well, we know, for example, that we have 12 notes. And we're going to kind of think of this as our alphabet in the language of music. And over the next few hours, I've got to teach you how to form like 50 different patterns. out of these, uh, out of this 12 note alphabet. And these patterns are very much kind of like the words in the language. And they have spellings out of this 12 unit alphabet. And as I mentioned before, when you're moving your fingers around on your guitar, you're typing these words out of this 12 note alphabet down there. So you've got to learn these 50 patterns. Just to control any language, you've got to have a vocabulary in the language. You've got to uh, learn these 50 different patterns. If you're interested in how these 50 break down, by the way, I didn't quite leave myself enough room to write this up here. Here it is. Here's how the number 50 breaks down. There are three big categories of intervals that you have to know about. Chords, which I'm sure you've heard about. Scales, which I'm sure you've heard about. And intervals, interestingly enough, is the third one. A lot of people haven't heard of those, which is kind of strange, again, because if you don't understand intervals, you'll never really understand scales and chords. Um, and the number 50 breaks down something like this. You have 13 different intervals that you have to learn. 14 different scales that you have to learn, and somewhere in the vicinity of about 20 different chords that you have to learn to play popular music. Remember, that's the promise I make everyone around here. We're not going to stuff your head with, full of a bunch of dumb junk that you don't need to know. This is just about pop music. About That's what most of you are interested in. If you wanted to play classical music or jazz, the more complex styles of music, you would have to know all this stuff anywhere, anyway. But for example, then that number 50, I'd say you'd about have to triple that. To play any style of music, you, you have to know about 150 different patterns. But, and, and we're going to look at a lot of those just basically, but there is a core group of these 50 different patterns that you have to know in order to get yourself started, in order to understand basic popular music. So you've got to learn these 50 different patterns. But, and here's the big stuff coming right now. One thing you've got to understand is each one of these patterns exists like simultaneously in like four different dimensions. Each one of these patterns has four different aspects, four different faces, and you need to learn to recognize it no matter which of its four faces it shows you. Um, so what I always say is there are four ways to know each pitch pattern, and this is a hugely misunderstood thing in music. But this will, if you understand this, this will set the tone for the whole rest of your musical career. This in a sense is all you have to do. You've got to learn these 50 different patterns and you have to learn each one four different ways. You want to know the really cool thing about this is, once again, this is not weird, abstract, alien information that you don't know anything about because I'm going to suggest that you know every single one of your patterns in the English language the same four ways. This is not just specific to music. This is how you use uh, your words in any language. And if you look at it that way, this will help you understand music because you can look at music exactly the way you look at any, any language you speak. And, and mostly we're talking about English here, aren't we? Um, 
Um, you know every word in the English language these same four ways, and if you visualize it that way, it'll help you kind of understand how music works. And, and you, you'll be able to really just zip through this stuff and really understand what I'm talking about. Now, most of our friends only know their patterns like one way, which I'm going to suggest is kind of like completely a dead end. And if they know their patterns at all, it's usually this way down here, number four. But we're going to start up at the top here. This is kind of the linchpin. Uh, all the other ones will start to work if you basically understand understand this one up here. And here we go. This might be the most important stuff you ever learn about music. You have to know each pattern four ways. Think of any word you know in the English language, and I'm going to suggest that the first way that you know any word in any language is you have it in your mind. You are able to think in the language. Isn't that true? The only way that I'm able to speak to you right now is because I already have all these words in my mind, right? These words aren't just flying out of my mouth. I'm constructing these sentences in my head and then I am speaking them. You have to have the language in your mind first before you can do anything with it, right? Now, in a musical context, let's say this then. The first way you have to know your chords and your scales and your intervals is you have to have them in your mind. Remember, my great quote is, you don't play the guitar with your fingers, you play it with your head. You play it with your mind. The, the finger stuff is just the typing stuff. So the first way that you need to understand your pitch patterns is you need to understand them as concepts. That's the first way. You have to be able to think in the language. You have to know your pitch patterns as concepts. This is the whole world of music theory. Now, this is a word that strikes terror in a lot of people's hearts. They've tried to take music theory classes at school. They've tried to read books and they, oh my God, this stuff is really confusing and complicated and it just isn't. It's just, music, as you're going to hear me say, is the worst taught subject of all times. Are you having any trouble understanding what I'm saying so far in lesson number one and, and in this lesson? I hope not. I, if you're not, then you're probably not going to have any problem with any of this. It doesn't get any harder than this. It's just usually they explain music in the wrong order. That's, I think, what I've figured out. And I, hopefully I'm giving it to you in the right order. Now, nonetheless, a lot of people try to avoid learning their music theory because this is the part that's a little bit like school, you know what I mean? You're going to have to spend some time and it's not necessarily going to be the most fun part of your career. You're going to have to spend some time and you're going to have to memorize some stuff that's very much like spelling and vocabulary and stuff like that. People go, oh no, am I really going to have to do this? And the answer is yes. If you want to satisfy yourself, you're, you're just going to have to do a little bit of work. Remember, it's only 50 lousy words. The alphabet only has 12 units in it. What's the big deal? You know what I mean? If you just resign yourself to doing a little bit of school type work, the benefits will be there. Now, long before they could teach you any words in a language, they have to make sure that you know the alphabet. So the first thing that you got to do in any language is you have to make sure that you know the alphabet. So let's check in with that for a moment. You know now that the musical alphabet has 12 units in it. What are those units called? Uh, a lot of you probably have a lot of kind of confusion about that too. Let's get that nailed down once and for all. Now here's 13 little boxes that I made up along the top here. You're going to see, now you know there's 12 notes. You'll see in a moment why I made 13 boxes. We humans have come up with several different uh, systems over the centuries to assign names to these 12 units in our pitch system. We're going to talk about several of these as we go on, but the only one we're going to talk about for today is the one that you probably know a little bit about already. It's loosely based on the English language. Um, you know, each of the 26 units in the English alphabet has a name, right? And as you know, the first unit in the English alphabet is A. And so it is in the musical alphabet uh, as well. Now, if we can look up over here at this other end, what's the name of this 13th note up here? Remember, there's 12 units, but this is the 13th note. This is also A. That's where it starts over again at that point. You know there's more than 12 keys on a piano. You're going to find out the guitar plays more than 12 notes. Remember, these 12 notes repeat in different octaves. And, and what do you call this distance between one note that has a particular alphabet letter like A and, and then you jump over the other 11 notes and you land on the 13th note up here that has the same alphabet letter as the one you started on? What is that distance called? That is what is called an octave. 
You've heard that word before, but you might not have exactly known what it is. An octave is a particular interval, by the way. It's the distance between the first note and the 13th note up there. It's uh, uh, from one A to the next, or from one D to the next higher D than that. That's what we know as an octave. Now, let me ask you this. What's the name of the very next note higher in pitch than A? It's not B, interestingly enough. B is actually right here. There's another note in between A and B, and one way we can see that is by looking up here at the piano keyboard. Here's A on a piano keyboard, and A is always the note that is just to the right of center in the group of three black keys. There's the three black keys right there, and you'll notice just to the right of center is A right there. Well, here's B right here, but notice in between A and B is one of these black keys. This is one of those sharp and flat notes. Um, now, do you know what the words sharp and flat mean? A lot of people are confused about this. It's very, very simple. What do the words sharp and flat mean? They're just very old words. They uh, evolved in some other culture. I really don't know where they came from. They don't mean the same things to us that they, mean, that, that they meant to the culture they originally uh, evolved in. They are simply, I kind of compare them to like port and starboard on a boat. You know, these are old words that sailors use to talk about left and right. You know, port and starboard. You know what I'm talking about? They don't mean the same thing to us anymore. Well, the words sharp and flat flat are just like that in the musical language. Um, it, they just tell you what direction to go in. Now, what directions do you go in in pitch? Up and down, right? High and low. Up and down. That's all these two words mean. Sharp, which has a symbol like a pound sign, which you've seen before, simply means higher in pitch. That's all it means. A lot of people think it has some magical meaning. It doesn't. A sharp just means higher in pitch. And flat, which has a symbol like a lowercase b, like that, simply means lower in pitch. So, if we can take a look back up here again, here's A in our musical alphabet, and here's B. These were both white keys on the piano. In between there was this black key. In between A and B, there was this black key up there. What's the name of that note? Well, sometimes it's more convenient to think of that as the next note higher than A, so we call it A sharp. But what a lot of people don't understand is in an equal number of contexts, it's more convenient to think of that as the next note lower than B, so we call it B flat. A sharp and B flat are exactly the same note for all intents and purposes. There are some tiny little times that you're going to find out about later on where that's not strictly true, but this is the way you want to look at it for now. A sharp and B flat are two names for the same note. And when do you call it A sharp and when do you call it B flat? I'll tell you about that later on. Um, uh, we don't have time to talk about that right now. For now, it doesn't matter what you call it. Just remember that A sharp and B flat are the same note. Um, now, it gets even stranger. Here's B, right? What's the name of the next note higher than B? And people go, well, based on that, wouldn't it be like B sharp or C flat? And I go, y you would think so, wouldn't you? But interestingly enough, it doesn't work that way. Again, look at the piano keyboard up here. Here's A. Here's A sharp, B flat. Here's B. Look what happens next. There's two white keys in a row. There is no black key in between B and the next note. So interestingly enough, the very next note higher in pitch than B is C. There is no sharp and flat note in between B and C. People go, wow, this is weird. I go, well, yeah, a little bit. It's going to take a little bit of getting used to. Uh, some of you have tried to learn about this stuff before and didn't quite see how it works, and you're confused. Um, I, I'm, I'm, hopefully, I'm showing you this in a way that you just won't be confused about it anymore. Another thing to understand is, you know what this means? As musical pitches, A and B are not the same distance apart that B and C are. B and C are only half as far apart as A and B are. Remember, each, all of the notes in our 12-note pitch system are all the same distance apart from the ones on either side of them. It's an interval, by the way, called a half step. You might have heard of that before. A half step is when you go from one note, say, to the note right next to it. It doesn't matter what color they are on a piano or what they're called. That's always a half step. B and C are only a half step apart in pitch, but A and B are what's called a whole step apart. 
half steps and whole steps. These are other examples of intervals, and we're going to be talking about those uh, intervals later on when we study the subject of intervals. Not all of the whole alphabet letter notes in the musical alphabet are the same distance apart, and I've had people that have been confused about that for years. B and C are only half as far apart as A and B are. Now, what's the name of the next note higher than C? Well, here's C on the piano right here. We do have a black key after that. What's the name of that note? Well, it's a little bit higher than C, so we call it C sharp. But it's a little bit lower than D, by the way, which is your next note up there. That's our next white key right there. There's C and there's D. In between is this note. It's got two names. Sometimes it's better to think of it as the next note higher than C. That's C sharp. Other times it's better to think of it as D flat. C sharp and D flat are the same note. Now, what's the next note after that? After D, we have another black key. That, of course, would be D sharp or E flat. Now, after D sharp, E flat, we have another white key. That's E. Remember, this is just going along right in alphabetical order, isn't it? Now, now it gets interesting again. Here's E on the piano, but look what happens next. There is a second place on the piano where there's no black key in between two white keys. The very next note higher than E is actually F. And remember, all of this stuff is going on on your guitar neck, too. Uh, I know we're looking at the piano and you want to take guitar lessons, but this is so much more linear. And to, to understand the concepts in music, we best look at it at the uh, on the piano keyboard first and next week we're going to be talking about how the guitar actually uh, plays these 12 notes. After F there is another black key. That would be of course F sharp or G flat. Two names for the same note. After that black key there's another white key. That of course would be G and then finally we have one more black key right there. The middle black key in the group of three would be G sharp or A flat and there it is. That's your 12th note right there. And then you find yourself right back on A again. And that's an octave higher than this other A down here that we originally started on down there. See, they're in the same place, just to the right of center in the group of three black keys. And how many notes are in between? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and then the thirteenth note. And then you can go another octave in those alphabet letters and sharps and flats would just go again up into another octave like that and higher and lower than that. We're going to be talking about all this stuff more as we go on. So there is your musical alphabet there. You've got to make sure once and for all you get this down. They are 12 notes and they're all a half step apart from one another. As you go through them in a sequence, they're always a half step apart. B and C and E and F are not the same distance apart that, for example, F and G and G and A are. Those are whole steps. G and A are a whole step apart because you've got that other note in between. But E and F and B and C are only a half step apart. You've got to memorize your musical alphabet. The best way to do that, I guess, at least initially, would be to, uh, to, to, no to remember that they all have sharps and flats in between them except B and C and E and F. So you sit there and you go B, C, E, F, B, C, E, F, B, C, E, F. Do that a few times. Those are the places where there's no sharps and flats. You'll have your whole musical alphabet down. So there, remember, now what we're talking about is the four ways to know your pitch patterns. And the first way you have to know any word in any language is you have to have it in your head. You've got to be able to think in the language. You've got to understand your pitch patterns as concepts. That's the whole music theory stuff. And in order to do that, you've got to make sure you know the alphabet first. Now, doesn't that make sense? And, and, and a, a lot of this program, we're going to be talking about music theory. Don't worry about it. It's fascinating. Music I theory is fascinating if it's presented the right way. It's not the least bit boring. Remember, there's four ways to know each pitch pattern, though, and that's only the first way. The first way you have to know any word in any language is you have to be able to think it, right? Now, let's go on to number two. What's the second way that you need to know any word in any language? Well, the answer is you have to be able to recognize it when you see it represented by graphic symbols on a piece of paper. In other words, the second way that you have to know any word in any language is you have to be able to read it. You have to be able to read in the language. You know, now, now not, not everybody knows how to read in the English language, do they? But it's an awfully tough way to conduct yourself in society if you don't know how to read. Some people can do it, but it's certainly not the best way to go about it. Um, in any language, you've got to know how to read. So, if we put this in a musical context, the second way you need to know your scales and your chords and all your pitch patterns and stuff is you need to understand them as notation. 
you might also recall that notation is one of the six main areas of music, isn't it, that we talked about last week. Um, pitch, rhythm, timbre, dynamics, technique, and notation. You've got to know on some level how to read music. How are you going to learn those uh, 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 songs you want to play from the songbook if you don't know at least something about how to read music? Now, uh, later on in the program, I believe it's lessons 9 and 10, we're going to be showing you about learning how, uh, about reading music. There are several different styles of notation that we use for the guitar. There's standard notation, which many of you have come across before if you've taken other music lessons. You also know something about tablature, some of you uh, who, who have already played for a while and, and stuff like that. Also, those, there's those little chord boxes and things like that that you know th that you've seen where they put the little dots you know uh, there to show you where to actually put your fingers many of you have seen these different styles of notation so um, we are not going to really talk about reading music in this particular thing because I've got, I got so little time here and we've got to go on to number three here because this is actually the big one. But on some level, you, you may know that a lot of rock and roll players do not know how to read standard notation on the guitar. Uh, and, and so we're, we're not going to force you to learn how uh, to read standard notation in this program. But certainly if you ever want to be one of the world's great guitar players, or if you want to play jazz or classical music, you've got to learn how to read standard notation. For the rest of us, uh, maybe... Uh, uh, tablature might be good enough um, and and and, and we'll be putting that more in perspective later on. But anyway, the second way that you need to know any word in any language is you have to recognize it when you see it on paper. You have to be able to read, at least on some level, in the language. Now, on to number three down here. This is the big one, and this, I swear, I think this is the most important stuff you're ever going to learn from anybody on the subject of music right here. Uh, I hope they carve this on my tombstone. If I can get people to understand this, I feel like I've done my job. you got to think in the language, you got to read in the language, but isn't it true, wouldn't you say that the most important way that you know any word in any language is you recognize it when you hear it. You know what it sounds like. Third, and probably most importantly, you need to be able to hear in the language. You need to be able to recognize what your different words sound like. You can do exactly the same thing in music. The third way, I mean, music is an audio art form, isn't it? Isn't the most important thing about it how it sounds? You know what I mean? So, we put this in a musical context. The third way that you need to know your chords and your scales and your intervals is you need to know what they sound like. You need to know them as patterns of real sound. This, of course, is the whole world of playing by ear. And everybody wants to play by ear, don't they? Uh, we all have friends that, that, that claim to play by ear and stuff like that. But what you're going to find out is there's two different ways to play by ear. There's a smart way to play by ear, and there's a not-so-smart way to play by ear. And most of the people that you've ever met who play by ear, play by ear the not-so-smart way. And, I, and, and I'll show you what that is. You, 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 you walk up to this guy, and, and he's playing this Pearl Jam song off the radio, and you go, wow, that's that Pearl Jam song off the radio. How did you learn that? And he goes, I figured it out by ear. And wow, we're impressed. You figured that out by ear? Wow. But there's a few things that guy isn't telling you. First of all, he's not telling you how long it took him to figure it out. Now, for example, it might have taken him hours or days or weeks to figure out that Pearl Jam song by ear. Because the way a lot of people play by ear is they kind of stumble around, kind of trial and error on their instrument. And some people can actually get to a point where they can do that fairly well and figure out some reasonably complicated stuff. But the way most people play by ear is they just sort of stumble around on the instrument and hope for the best. And it might take them hours to figure out Pearl Jam. I usually know how to play the whole song by the time the song's over. Three minutes, five minutes, I can figure out a Pearl Jam song. Might have taken this guy five hours or five days. So the first thing that guy's not telling you is how long it took him to figure out by ear. The second thing he's not telling you is he tried to figure out ten other songs this week and he didn't get anywhere with the other ten. He's playing you that Pearl Jam song because that's the only one he had any success with. There were ten other songs that he, they were just too hard. He couldn't get a grasp. He couldn't figure out how they worked. And the third thing he's not telling you is there's a list of about 
500 other songs that he'd like to be able to play, that he'd like to be able to figure out by ear, but he wouldn't even try because he just knows he couldn't do it. Wouldn't, he, wouldn't even try. They're too complicated. Yeah, maybe he can figure out Pearl Jam, but can he figure out more complicated bands like Fish or like Dave Matthews or like Steely Dan or like, or, or like Primus or King Crimson? Um, you, you know, it's easy to figure out certain styles of music, but more complex styles of music, a lot of people could never begin to play by ear if they play by ear that not so smart way. So, how would you like to be able to figure out anything just by listening to it a few times? Wouldn't that be cool? Well, in order to do that, you've got to learn to play by ear the smart way. And that involves this concept right here. All real musicians go through a program known as ear training. Ear training. Ever heard of it? Ever heard of ear training? Out of a hundred students a year that I have, I can generally only count on about a half a dozen people having ever even heard of ear training, yet alone know, knowing what it actually is. Um, those are the two most important words, as far as I'm concerned, that you're ever going to hear anybody say on the subject of music. If you want to be a real musician, you've got to get trained ears. And what does that mean? Well, what ear training is all about is about working out with a coach who already knows knows what these 50 different patterns sound like and you're given clues about what to listen for in order to get to the point where you can recognize what they actually sound like. All of these 50 patterns sound like something and they sound different from the other 49 patterns as surely as the word cat sounds different than the word dog. And with a certain amount of work, you can get to the point where you know what all of your 50 patterns sound like, and then it's not a matter of stumbling around trying to figure out what that song is. The stuff comes out of the speaker, and you're going, oh, I know that chord. Oh, I know that scale. Oh, I know that riff. Just like you're learning from me in the English language right now because I'm speaking to you, right? And you're going, oh, I know that word. Oh, I know that word. Oh, I know that word. Oh, I know what this guy's trying to say. Imagine if you could do the same thing with music. You put the disc in, hit the play button. Oh, I know that chord. Oh, I know that riff. And then the only thing finally that you have to know then is you have to know the finger patterns so that you can play that stuff yourself. And let's do a quick segue in down here into the fourth way. Let's get this one out of the way. We're going to come back and talk some more about ear training in a minute, but ju just because of what I just said right there, you've got to be able to think in the language. You've got to be able to read in the language. You've got to be able to hear in the language. But finally, the last thing is you have to be able to turn around and you have to be able to make that noise yourself, don't you? You have to be able to speak in the language. And there it is, the four ways to know your pitch patterns. Think them, read them, hear them, speak them. Isn't that true? You can do that with any word in the English language, can't, can't you? Over your course of your music career, you've got to get better and better at doing your pitch patterns, your scales and your chords and everything, these same four ways. Now, you're going, speak? Wait a minute, I'm a guitar player. What's that got to do? Speak? What do you mean? Well, um, this is number four down here, the fourth way that you have to know your patterns in any languages, you have to be able to speak them. Now, this one's a little abstract. L let me suggest that whenever you speak in a language, you use some kind of machine. Like it might be blah, 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 this machine right there. That's a machine, isn't it? And somebody had to teach you how to use that machine. Or maybe it's a, a typewriter, like we said before. You use the typewriter to speak for you. Or maybe you use sign language and you know how to sign. You use your hand as the machine to speak with. Well, it's just in music, we use one of these kinds of machines to speak with. And particularly since you're here to learn how to play the guitar, let me suggest that the way that you learn to make your machine speak for you is you learn how to manipulate the machine with your fingers. The fourth way that you need to know your scales and your chords and everything is you have to know them as finger patterns. And, you know, that's what an awful lot of people think that's all there is to playing the guitar, is learning more and more of these different finger patterns. That, in many of you, that, that's the way that you've been doing it so far. You've been buying these chord books and stuff, and you've been learning where to put your fingers and all. But 
that's really not where it's where it's at, you know what I mean, in the language. That that's just like the typing part of the language. You know, but as we said before, the typewriter doesn't write the book, does it? You write the book with the command of the language in your mind. But then yes, you've got to know about your fingers patterns too in order to make your machine speak for you. You have a lot of practicing to do. You're going to have plenty of exercises and scales and, and stuff that you're going to need to learn how to play on your guitar. That's the finger pattern stuff. That's speaking in the language. But let's go back up here. We got to finish up our thoughts on this ear training. Remember I said this is the two most important words you'll ever hear me say. Most people have never even heard of ear training. And that's so weird once again because you know like I say the, there, there's like real musicians and then there's people that are just kind of like pretend musicians. Um, now I'm not saying you have to go to music school to be a real musician, but it sure as heck doesn't, doesn't doesn't hurt and of course to go to music school you've got to read and and the other thing that people don't understand is ear training most of us who have never even heard of ear training ear training is the second required course at music school and, and it's so funny that most people have never even heard of it. Ear training is the second required course at music school, right behind music theory. Everybody seems to understand that, that they're going to go to music theory class and learn about those alphabet letters and those sharps and flats and all the conceptual stuff about music. What so few people understand is probably around 11 o'clock your theory course is going to be dismissed and you're going to go down to room 204 and that's going to be the ear training lab and you're going to spend uh, several hours in there with your ear training coach. Now, get yourself trained ears and here's all the amazing things that will open up for you. First of all, you will be able to listen learn. That is, any song you want to play, you'll just be able to listen to it a few times and, and you'll figure out how to play it. Now, it's a skill that takes some time to acquire, but, but if you work at it, uh, you'll be able to do it. The second thing you'll be able to do is you'll be able to compose music. Everybody wants to know how to write songs. Well, the, the best way, there's, a, there's people who don't really have trained ears, although I shouldn't say that because everybody in this modern era has trained ears to a certain degree because the mere act of listening to music is actually a form of ear training. Um, but if you ever really want to get to the point th th that you can uh, uh, compose your own music, uh, you really have to get your ears trained. And, and we'll be talking about that more as the program goes on. Finally, the third thing, and one of the coolest things that you'll be able to do if you get trained ears, is you'll be able to improvise people go, really? And I go, yeah, that's com almost completely where improvisation comes from, and I'm going to show you that in just a second. But, but before I do, let me g give you a couple of little more examples of how ear training works. Um, ear training, as I said, is you work out with a coach who gives you clues about how to recognize what these different patterns sound like. Remember I said they all sound different from, an, from one another, just like the word cat sounds different than the word dog. And I'll give you your first example of that right, uh, right now so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, you've got these 20 different chords that you have to learn and, and you have to learn them four different ways. Think them, read them, hear them, speak them. You've got to learn what they sound like. You've got to recognize them by ear. Here's your first little ear training clue. There's a lot of different types of chords, but I'm oversimplifying a bit, but they all seem to fall into one category or another. There's all these old uh, other, there's all these chords over here that are called major chords. Some of you already know about this. And there's these other chords over here that are called minor chords. How do you tell by ear the difference between a major chord and a minor chord? There's a lot of subtle things that you listen for about the various notes that are in them, in, in other words, in, in, and other things like that. But one really cool thing to realize is that they just sound different and they make you feel differently. Here's your first clue for recognizing the difference between major chords and minor chords. Most people would agree that major chords sound happy and minor chords sound sad. So, what am I playing right now? Can you tell me, is this a happy sounding major chord or a sad sounding minor chord? Take a second. What do you think? Now, a lot of you are going to have trouble at first. You're not going to necessarily be able to do this instantly. That is a happy sounding major chord. Listen to it again. Now, I'm going to turn it into a minor chord and notice how it sounds sad. That's the sad sounding minor chord. There's the happy sounding major chord. Here's another one. Is this a happy sounding major chord or a sad sounding minor chord? What do you think? Hopefully you said that that's a sad sounding minor chord and you'd be right. Now here's a major version of the same chord. And happy music generally has more happy chords in it. And um, sad music generally has more minor chords in it. 
da 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 so there you go. That's the difference between major chords and minor chords. We said there are 20 chords that you have to learn the sounds of. You got 18 more to go. What's the big deal? Some chords sound like fear. Some chords sound like surprise. Some chords sound like uh, uh, ecstasy. They sound even beyond happy. And, and I think that's the way I identify a lot of my chords is basically by how they make me feel. And there, of course, there are a lot of other tricks too. Ear training is a big process. It takes a long time to get your ears trained and we'll be putting that in perspective more as we go on in the program. Another whole aspect of ear training is all about singing. Uh, a, a good ear training coach makes you sing various patterns and various relationships. The reason being that, that the singing of the pattern is the only proof that anyone ever has that, uh, that, that you actually know what these different patterns sound like. I'll give you an example of that. Here's a note on the piano. Can you hum that note? I can. Uh, uh. That would prove to my ear training coach that I actually know what that note sounds like. Uh, some of you are going to have trouble with that. You know what I mean? You may have to work at that for a, a little while in your, your first couple of hours of ear training. Now, what the rest of ear training is all about is that your ear training coach quizzes you on uh, what different patterns sound like and the only way that he can tell whether you know what they sound like or not is is being able to sing them now for example we were talking a few minutes ago about an octave right that's when you go from one note in our pitch system up to the next one that has the same alphabet letter up there well an octave is a pitch pattern that you're going to want to learn the sound of and the only way your ear training coach will know whether you know what an octave sounds like is if you can sing it now i play this first note here uh, and he'll go to me, uh, okay, you know what that note sounds like. Can you, can you sing the note that is the next octave higher than that? And here I go. I'll sing the lower one first. Uh, now here's the higher one. Uh, uh, uh. Now let's see if I'm right. Do, do. And he goes, fine, okay, you know what an octave sounds like. Let's go work on some other pattern. And eventually you work your way through all your 50 patterns and you convince your ear training coach that you know what the stuff sounds like by being able to sing them for you. For him. And, and people go, oh, God, that's going to be hard. That's going to be embarrassing. I go, don't worry about it. Uh, you, you know what I mean? You, it's just something you got to face up to. And, and ear training, once you get in there, it's, it, you'll, you'll see, you'll start to go, oh, my God, this is the whole thing. If I could do this with music, I can do anything I want. I can figure out songs by listening to them. I can write my own music. And the last thing I want to show you about today is about improvising. This is huge. A lot of you are interested in styles of music like blues and jazz and rock. And these styles of music all involve an element of improvising. Improvisation. You, uh, some, uh, I'm surprised about how many people don't know that, but particularly in styles of, of popular music like blues, you know, when that guy gets up there and plays that guitar solo in the middle of the song, you know, right, that, that, that he doesn't play it the same way every night. He plays it differently each night. And that is one of the most fun things. I know a lot of you already know about this and, and want to be able to improvise. This is what jamming is all about. It, you go over to your friend's house and, and, and you're, you're making up the music right on the spot. That's what improvising is all about. How do you improvise? You improvise by having trained ears. A lot of people don't understand that. They think that learning to improvise has to do with learning more and more finger patterns and learning more and more music theory. And it's true, both of those things are important, but it's not really where the improvisation really comes from. The improvisation comes from having trained ears and one of, and, and you know that singing thing I was talking about? Believe it or not, a lot of tr you are gonna have a lot of trouble believing what I'm saying right now, but I'm gonna play you an example in just a second. Um, uh, my great quote is, you are never going to play a better guitar solo than you can sing. And people go, huh? What the heck? Nobody's ever said anything like this to me before. That's because I'm telling you the truth, and I'll show you what I mean. Um, I'm going to play you a little bit of a tune that I wrote right here. Um, this is uh, a piece I wrote, so it's a kind of a funky, jazzy kind of tune. And um, uh, so you'll see a little bit of my ability to, to compose. This is just a little practice tape I have. And over the top of that, I'm going to improvise, and I think you'll think it's pretty good. And then I'm going to show you where that improvisation came from. Ready? Here we go. It's kind of a, you'll, you'll like this, I think. Uh, kind of a funky, rocky, jazzy, bluesy thing. Let's see how I do.
good, huh? I'm a little, this is a little early in the morning for me, but wouldn't you like to be able to improvise at least that well? Maybe you'd like to be able to improvise better than that. Now, a lot of people think, oh, you did that because you learned more and more finger patterns and stuff like that, but that's not where it came from. You want to know where that solo came from? It came from my mind, and I'll prove it. You'll never play a guitar solo better than you can sing. You want to hear where that solo really came from? Came from right here. Now, it's just that most people would rather listen to the guitar than my crappy voice. So, all I do is I know where to put my fingers in order to create the notes that I hear in my head. So, here's the whole solo together. See, it's all ear training, the two most important words you'll ever hear me say. We have so much more to talk about all that stuff. I, I can't believe I even managed to get this in in an hour, but they're showing me that we're out of time for now. Hopefully you got it. It's all in your support material, too. So we'll see all you guys next week, okay? And we'll talk more about this stuff. Have fun. Bye-bye.